Well, good morning, friends. My name is Micah, and I'm one of the pastors here at Broad Street United Methodist Church. Let me add my greeting that you, to those that you have already heard this morning. I pray that uh, you're having a great summer. If this is the first time you've ever worshipped with us, we're so glad that you're with us today. If you're a frequent worshiper with us here at Broad Street, we're just so glad to see you once again here on this online service. And we're praying health over you. We're praying a good season. We're praying that God's doing a new thing in the midst of our community. So welcome, and we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Now before I begin, I want to say a couple of things about masks. There's a lot of debate out there and a lot of conversation about masks, and I would like to go on record to say that masks are a good thing. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a politician, I'm a pastor. But I think masks in this season are a good thing. They help us from transmitting the virus from one to another. They help protect us and keep us safe. So please, do yourself, do your loved ones, and do the kingdom a favor. And when you have that opportunity, when you're out in public, go ahead and put on a mask. I've been practicing wearing masks as I go into stores and as I go into places where others are gathered, I've been wearing a mask. In fact, a, a beloved saint of the church has made most of us on the staff here a, a mask. It's got the United Methodist cross and flame on the mask, and it's just a, a really wonderful mask. Now, an interesting awareness came to me this week. As I was walking through the aisles at Walmart, wearing my mask, and seeing all of the other people wearing their masks, I walked alongside of a person that I didn't realize I recognized. I had taken three steps past that person and thought to myself, hey, I think that was my friend Chris. So I stopped in the middle of Walmart with all of the items that I was carrying and I turned around 180 degrees. Now y'all have done it before, haven't you? Called out someone's name only to find out that that wasn't the person at all. So I wanted to be careful. I turned and walked behind that person much like a stalker would stalk behind their person they were tracking until I could safely identify whether or not this was Chris. As I got alongside of the person that I assumed was Chris, I kind of peeked oddly around to identify if it was really Chris or not. The problem was this. When I turned and looked, all I could see were two eyeballs. I could only see a portion of the person that I thought was Chris, and I was completely uncertain whether this was my friend, Chris, or not. You see, masks cover up a great bit of who we are. I think masks are very important. However, when a portion of our identity is covered up, it begins to leave doubt. It begins to add questions. Do I really know what I think I know? I'm sure in the midst of conversations you've experienced this, even with people who you know who you're talking to. Are they smiling? Are they laughing? Are they frowning? Are they upset with this conversation? Because when something is masked, you're never 100% certain. Today we're going to talk about a God who is unmasked. A God who leaves no doubt about who he is. 
Jesse and Ethan have done such a great job of telling this story of Moses. Moses, who was tapped out to be the leader of Israel, who feels uncertain about his own position, about his own abilities, about his own gifts, knowing that he's going to be returning to a hostile environment where the Hebrew people would not trust him and where the Egyptians would oppress him. And so he looks at God and he says, when I go, who should I tell them has sent me? God, take off your mask. God, leave no doubt. God, tell us who you are so that when I go, I can tell the people that you sent me. And he says, when you go, tell them I am sent you. I am who I say I am. Now, there's a lot that could be discussed about this very important phrase in the Old Testament. It becomes the, the name of God that the Jewish people used all the way up until today, this name Yahweh. In fact, it's such a revered name that it wasn't spoken. The vowels didn't exist. It was simply a word that was revered for a God who says, I am who I say I am. And for the entirety of the whole Testament, it's simply a God who is who he says he is. A God who can be trusted, a God who can believe, be believed, a God who exists. Now today we're going to turn into the New Testament. We're going to look at the Gospel of John. In fact, I'd invite you now to turn to John chapter 8. But before we begin, I just simply want you to understand that that God that met with Moses in the midst of a Jewish pandemic... A God who met with a group of people who were in the midst of absolute slavery and social injustice. That God who the people needed more in a moment of time than any other time in human history is the same God that we find now in John chapter 8. And it's the same God that meets us in the middle of July in 2020. A God who says, I am who I say I am. Well, God, what does that mean? What does that mean for, for me today? What does that mean for me who is unemployed or underemployed? What does that mean for me who is struggling with relationship? What does that mean for me today, God, who's dealing with a health crisis in my life? What does that mean for me today, God, a, a person who is struggling with alcohol, drugs, or tobacco, or some issue that's eating me up inside? What does that mean for me, God, who's dealing with darkness in, this, in the midst of my life? What does it mean, God, when you say, I am who I say I am. Listen to what he says in John chapter 8. Verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The truth is the world is dark. The world is full of pain. The world is broken. It wasn't my intent. It wasn't my plan for my children early in life. I had created a garden in which there was shalom, peace. Food sprung up from the ground. They were simply to come in and steward the earth, just knowing only goodness. This was my plan for creation. But darkness entered in. The world was broken. And since that brokenness has spread from person to person, through this original sin, through all of humanity, to where darkness covers the earth, it was not my plan. But even in the midst of human brokenness, in the midst of human pain, in the midst of human tragedy, 
I am. I am light. And those that choose to follow light instead of darkness will have light that illumines all of life. It will illumine relationship. It will illumine pain. It will illumine justice. It will illumine every step that you take, even that painful reality of addiction. And when you follow the light, darkness will be defeated. I am who I say I am, Yahweh. Now this morning, I, I hope you've printed out your sermon notes uh, because we're going to walk this circle of I am, Yahweh, in the Gospel of John. If you haven't printed it out, you can go to the computer right now. Just print that out real quickly. There's a place for you to, to kind of write this in. Because I believe that when God speaks through his son, Jesus Christ, in the Gospel of John, he's giving us a template or a picture through these I am sayings in John of who God is as the light of the world. That isn't some ethereal, isn't some kind of hypothetical answer to the question of darkness in life. I believe he's giving us a very practical response. A very practical place to go. A strong tower or a refuge in the midst of our own personal confusion. In the midst of our own personal darkness. A place where we can come to take refuge in the person of Yahweh. In the hope of God. So in John. God says, through Jesus, I am. In fact, they're very famous. There's seven I am sayings that become this wheel of Yahweh in the Gospel of John. Real briefly, I want you to, to just hear these and, and write them down. You'll have time to go back and read them this week. But here are the, the seven sayings or the seven I am sayings in the Gospel of John. He says in John chapter 8, verses 12, I am the light of the world. In John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 10 and 7, he says, I am the gate for the sheep, and the sheep enter through me. In John 10, 11, and again in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In John 15 and 1, he says, I am the true vine. And in John 14 and 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then at the top of this hermeneutical wheel, there's this last I am saying of John, of Jesus in John. It comes in John 11 and 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now these are big claims from the person of Jesus. These are direct references back to the time where God spoke to Moses and he said, I am. And when Jesus uses the word I am, there can be no break between the story of Moses and the deliverance of his people in Egypt to the person and work of Jesus in the New Testament and the era that we live in of deliverance from bondage, darkness, pain, suffering, and agony. Jesus says, just as God delivered his people from Egypt, so too will I deliver you from the bondage, from the darkness, and from the pain of your life. Now these I am sayings are beautiful in and of themselves, but the truth is, Remember, whenever a name of God is proclaimed, a name like Yahweh or I am, it points back to the larger character of who God is, his unique working within the opportunity for us as disciples who follow Jesus. So let us look once again at these I am sayings and understand what Jesus is really saying when he says, I am. 
John 8 and 12, I am the light of the world. You know, I believe that Jesus is telling you that he is the incarnational witness of God. You know, it's hard to seem to understand a God who is in existence. Hard to know a God that we cannot see, we cannot touch. We understand rulers and royalties of this world because they are physical. We can hear them speak. We can see them. But that God that created in the Garden of Eden after that that, that entrance to the, the Garden of Eden was closed, there was no visible manifestation of God. Moses wanted to see God, but even even Moses himself had to be tucked into a cleft of the mountain. God had to pass by because his magnificence and his radiance was too much for a human being to, to, to bear. And so Moses was tucked into the cleft of the mountain. His eyes were covered until God passed by, and it was only from behind that God could turn himself and avail himself to the backside of God's glory. As human beings, God's, God's presence and God's radiance would be way too much for us in the midst of our darkness. His light would be too grand for us to behold. And so God came as truly God in the form of a human being. Why was God fully God and fully human in Jesus Christ? Because if he came as fully God, it would have been way too much for humanity to understand or behold. And so he veiled himself in the form of a human. Considering equality with not something to be grasped at, Jesus came in the form of a servant, but he came as a witness, the incarnational representation of God to humanity. God did not mask himself, but in Jesus bore witness to the person and work of who God was. For three years, he entered into public ministry, and he showed himself to the entire world. He availed himself to everyone, and God revealed that I am is real. Jesus came down and revealed that I am is open for all people of all times, of all places. Jesus is the witness to the person and work of the triune God. I am the witness. He says in John 6 and 35, I am the bread of life. In saying that he is the bread of life, Jesus comes back and says, Behold, I am the provision. I am the God who provides. Our Father gives every good and perfect gift unto us. The word bread here is no mistake. In fact, the word Bethlehem, The city Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, actually means the house or the city of bread. And here comes Jesus from the house or the the city of bread, literally to say that he knows our needs and he well provides for them. He is the sustainer of life, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and he will be the one. When we are in great need, when we are hungry, when we are naked, when we are without clothing, when we are alone, when we are in pain, God himself will provide for our daily needs. That's why Jesus said, the birds of the air and the lilies of the valley do not worry about what they will eat or drink, nor do they worry about what they will wear, because the Lord your God provides. I am provides. John 10 and 7 says, I am the sheep gate. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the means of entry. You have to understand what the the sheep gate meant. The sheep gate meant 
the place of, uh, of home, the place where sheep would be bedded down for the night. When a shepherd would go out into the fields for weeks and months at a time, they didn't come home at night to a, a home corral, but rather they gathered rocks and they built a sheepfold. And it is inside of that sheepfold where the, the sheep would gather. At night, there would be an opening about five and a half feet wide. And in the midst of that opening between the, the rock quarry that's built, the, the, the fold that has been built, the shepherd literally would lay down and let his body serve as the gate. Once the sheep are in, the shepherd lays down so that in the midst of the night, if a wild animal or, or someone that's coming to persecute the sheep were to come, they'd have to come through the shepherd, through the gate first because they couldn't jump over the walls Jesus says I am the sheep gate if you want to become whole if you want to experience what it means to be with your father to experience peace and love and truth and grace if you if you've been longing for a place to be fully known then I will open up the door. I am your means of entry, and I will welcome you, and I will bring you into the fold. It's very important to understand that the doorway to God is always open, but there is a door, there is a gate. And that gate is literally the person of Jesus. He is the means of entry into union with God himself. It's God through Jesus who opens the door and welcomes all to the Father. Because I am is the gate. John 10, 11 and 14 says, not only am I the gate, but I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let us be clear today. God is our sovereign protector. God stands on the watch. God looks after us. Through his son, Jesus Christ, God goes forth before us. And much like a shield that we would wear, Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and the person and work of God goes before us, protecting us and shielding us in each and every day. Now the truth is, we don't know exactly how that works. We don't know why sometimes God permits some, th th some things and why sometimes God prevents some things. The truth is, God doesn't owe us answers. But we know this. That when God travels before us in the personal work of Jesus, when he goes before us, we are experiencing the full armor of God and the protection of of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and the personal work of Jesus. When Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep, that wasn't a metaphor because shortly thereafter, he went to a cross on Calvary. He did not consider his own life, but rather gave his as a substitution for us giving us the ultimate protection, protection against that sin that broke us into darkness from that original garden in the very first place and every subsequent sin that took place thereafter. He protected us from our own bare essential gravity and he came back in and said, I will prevent you from death for I am your protector. John 15 Verse 1 says that Jesus is the true vine. Have you ever watched grapes grow? Grapes grow on a vine. But these branches will bear off of the, the main vine, and, and the branches are the, the connection piece to the, the main vine and the fruit itself. 
And what Jesus says to us is between the main vine and and the fruit itself, there is a, a branch that grows, a vine that grows off of the main branch. And Jesus says, I am that connector. I am the connecting branch. And you are the fruit. And my father is a wonderful vineyard planter, and and he is the gardener. And through this branch that holds on to the fruit, you are going to be supplied with all of the nutrients, all of the water, all of the chlorophyll, everything that you need to grow healthy and fruit and, and, and be great and healthy fruit. You will have everything that it takes to sustain your life, for I will keep you connected to the main branch, the Father. Through me, you'll be connected to God, for I am God. You know, sometimes we miss this in life. We worry so deeply about the main gate and and, and coming into the sheepfold that we absolutely miss the importance of that connection that we have that daily supply of God, the daily connection with God, the the time in prayer, the time in walking, the time in relationship. And it's literally as if this is our supply chain. This is our link to a healthy relationship with the Father. Jesus says, I am your connection. I am your supply. John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, so much is said about this verse, and and it's all wonderful. But today, I'd like you to focus just on these three words, way, truth, and life. In a very real way, Jesus is saying, I am your very existence. I am your life itself. The truth is that without Jesus, we are all wandering aimlessly, completely bound by darkness, completely lost in confusion. Life has no meaning. Life has no purpose. Existence itself is bound up in this chaos of of the cosmos. But because of Jesus, but because of his saving work, but because of his sacrificial atonement, our days make sense, our life has purpose, and truth itself is meaning-making inside of our life. Our moral construct, the choices that we make, The way that we speak, the way that we treat others are built on a fabric, not just simply because there's a a moral code out there that binds us to a certain type of behavior, but rather that the moral code points to the person who saved our life, to the person who brought meaning to our life in the very first place. And so it is not just simply morality for morality's sake but it becomes morality and choice out of discipleship because we believe that there's transformation taking place in this world. In other words, we're living as if God's kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven, that literally the world might be transformed, that earth may represent heaven, and the reflection of God might come through in the person of Jesus, in his work in our life. So that our ways, our paths, our existence become more like Christ and less like ourselves. Because in Jesus, life itself exists. And finally, John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. What is Jesus saying? He's simply saying that he has power over the grave. You remember what he said just before he moved from this earth. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me by the Father. I sit on his right hand. I sit in the hand of blessing of God himself. And I have been given authority over the grave. 
And this was proven true on that third day when the stone was rolled aside and he came out and revealed himself to the world. And it has been true, proven time after time after time by the saints that have gone before us, those whom God has rolled aside their stone, and the grave cannot hold them, nor the victory of death defeat them, but rather life itself, eternity with God, has been won by Christ. And that's why I am says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the power over the grave. Now what's interesting about these seven points, these seven I am sayings, is when you take them, they create a wheel of life. Protection, provision, the witness to the truth of God, the means of entry to God, the connection with God, the sustaining power, the victory over death, the understanding and the meaning of life in God. Literally, all of who we are exists. And so it brings us to a couple of really important realities when we simply say that God is Yahweh or when we say that God is I am. Real briefly, let me run through these last statements because I believe that I am declares. First, I believe that I am declares that God is eternal. God is eternal. There was no beginning and there was no end of who God is. I am simply existed. And from the beginning of time, God existed with these characteristics that we understand. And, and from the from, from eternity to eternity, God will exist with those eternal characteristics. Now, how do you understand that? I don't. And when I go to bed at night, my mind almost explodes to understand that there is no beginning and no end to God. I can't comprehend it. I can't explain it. The one thing that I can do is believe it. And I do. Here's what it says in Isaiah 40 and 28. The Lord is everlasting and he does not grow weary. If there's a God with no beginning and no end that loves me enough to be I am in my life and I'm all in. I'm all in because I know there was a beginning for me and I know this world projects an end. But if I am promises eternity with him, with the power of I am, then I'm all in, Yahweh. I'm all in. Secondly, I believe I am declares that God is completely and totally independent. He depends on nothing. God can't have the power over life and death if he's dependent upon something else to bring victory over life and death. God can't be the, the sovereign God of the universe. He can't be not sovereign if he's the one who delivers me and sustains me. If I'm counting on God to, to be the one who is going to sustain me and provide for me, to lay down his life, to be the, the entry for me, then he can't be dependent upon something else. Because if he is not sovereign or completely independent, then what about the time when I need him and then he has to go somewhere else to find the resources for me? It's incompatible. Only a God that's completely sovereign, completely independent, can offer what God offers. Acts 17 and 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the ruler. He is the principality. He is the sovereign God over heaven and earth. And here's what it says. That God does not live 
in temples made by human hands. That God doesn't live in a seat where he was elected through, through a popular election. He doesn't live in a house that was created by humanity. He is not dependent upon others to bring or, or give him power. But rather he spoke and the world was formed. And his temple is all of creation. And everything rolls up into him. Complete independence in the sovereign God that we know. Number three, I am declares that everything else in this universe, in this world, is utterly and completely dependent upon that sovereign God who made the universe. God is completely independent, but everything else is completely and utterly dependent. I can't save myself, neither can you. There are things that I can do to provide for myself, but ultimately, at some point, my ability to resource myself will run out. I cannot bring myself into the fold of God. Only God can do that for me. And if I live a life thinking that I am pretty independent, that I can just pull myself up by my, my own bootstraps, that this rugged individualism, that power of self will save me, and I've spent a lifetime in vanity and personal idolatry. And I'm headed for destruction. Job 12 and 10 says, In whose hand is the life of every living thing? And in whose mouth is the breath of all humankind? And maybe today, maybe today we need to surrender a little bit. To be able to step back and go, you know, for a long time I've kind of thought, I was, I am. But the truth is, we're only fooling ourselves. So these last two points are really important. Number one, through Jesus, through I am, we encounter the fullness of God. Through Jesus, we encounter the gate. We encounter connection with God. We encounter the power over death. We encounter what it means to be protected and provided. Through Jesus, we get the fullest expression of who God is. No mask, no hiding, no confusion. Through Jesus, we fully encounter God. And then finally, that encounter leads to I am. The true picture of who God is. You know, for the Egyptians, it was deliverance from, or for the Hebrews, the Israelites, it was deliverance from Egypt. For us, it's unique. It's personal. But it's real. If you want to experience the power of God, if you want to see I am revealed and encounter Jesus, because that's real. You know, have you ever seen a shadow before? I mean, really, have you ever seen a shadow before? A shadow doesn't exist, does it? I mean, you can't hold on to a shadow. You can't grab a shadow. You can't lift a shadow. The only way a shadow exists is through the substance of something that's real. Without the reality of the substance that casts the shadow, the shadow disappears and it's gone forever. It's time that we begin to understand our lives as a shadow of the person and work of God through his son, Jesus Christ. The truth of who he is revealed within us. Because the beauty is this, 
As the Bible says, it is the light that overcomes darkness. And that light has been revealed. And when it's shined on the person and work of Jesus Christ, his shadow will never diminish or go away. And when we live in that shadow, we understand who we were created to be. So my challenge to you this week is this. Where do you need I am revealed in your life? Do you need some real provision in your life? Do you need some some protection, some healing, some power in your life? Do you need to enter into the sheepfold in union with God? Do you need to understand salvation and life and hope and light? Do you need the very witness of God to believe that God is real? Maybe you've struggled and desired that your whole life, but you've never been able to cross that threshold to say, yes, God, I do believe. Today, pray to God. Say, I am, I believe. Help my unbelief. I am Yahweh, speak to me and reveal the very existence of life, the very existence of hope, the very existence of you. And then live in the shadow of Christ, for his substance shall never pass away. Will you pray with me this morning? God, thank you for this day and thank you for your love. Thank you that you never hid behind a mask. That you always revealed, always pursue. Help us this day to revel and understand the power of I am. The power of Yahweh. We love you. We believe you, and we believe in you. And it's in your name we pray. All God's people said, amen.